Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the biggest chess tournament of 2024. The Candidates. The Candidates is an eight player double round robin, which means there are 14 games and the winner of this event will play for the World Chess Championship. Now, this is the first time in history that the open candidates and the women's candidates are being held at the exact same time. And it's the first time in history the candidates is in North America, in Toronto, Canada, where I was just for 72 hours. I'm going to be posting a bunch of interviews that I did with players. I already posted one that I did with Hikaru and Fabiano. We have Yanni Pomnishi coming as well. Uh, I did an interview with Vichy Anand that's super special. I recorded a bunch of IRL content with chess fans. And now I'm back here and I'm making this recap for you. And for the first four days of the candidates, we're doing a candidate sale on Chessly. And uh, all my courses are 33% off. So get ready to follow uh, this tournament throughout the month of April on this channel. Here we go. In round number one, we have Fabiano Caruana versus Hikaru Nakamura. And uh, I will take you through every single game of the day. Let me know if you like this format because it's obviously eight games. I will be going quickly. Or if you want me to exclude certain things, if they're a little bit boring, do let me know. Fabiano Caruana opens with the move <clears throat> E4. And if you're wondering who's playing in the candidates, you will figure it out by the end of the recap, but I will give you an update every single day. Uh, last candidates, this was the exact matchup in the first round. Fabiano Caruana versus Hikaru. They make people from the same country play each other earlier so that there's no collusion. Not that they're accusing anybody, but it's just what they do. And Hikaru plays the Sicilian defense, the most combative, confrontational way to play against E4. The second way being the Scandinavian, but you will never see it in the candidates because it's poopy butt. C5. And we have an open Sicilian. And if you're going to play like this, you got two choices and three choices in this position. You play the Night Orf, the classical. You have the dragon. And then you have the classical Sicilian with knight C6. Ikaru plays E5. This is an insane move. Now, for most of you watching... You don't get it, and that's fine. And I'm not insulting you. I'm just saying there's a clear disconnect between top-level chess uh, and, and standard people at home like yourself watching. The reason why black goes here is to prevent any piece from going to b5. And this opening is called the Night Orf, and it survived the test of time. You know who would have literally 1,000 lines memorized against the Night Orf? Fabiano. Hikaru plays the accelerated Night Orf allowing bishop b5 check, and traditionally this position has been considered quite bad for black. Like black has to fight back and white is very active. Now what's fascinating is that this position was reached by Fabiano in a title Tuesday game. This is how online chess has completely transformed classical chess and traditional over the board play. Fabi in that game took the knight, rotated backwards, and dominated that square. But in this game, he plays a the retreating move bishop a4, which is not as popular gets his bishop kicked out, but this square is going to be up for grabs, and that is the square that Fabiano is going to try to utilize. Now, you're going to notice the engine gives this slightly better for white, because it is, because it's a dubious way of playing the Sicilian, but Hikaru wants to take Fabi out of his comfort zone, and the players play a bunch of theory. Bishop f6, bishop f6. As you see, everything in Fabiano's position is around the light squares in the center. We have opposite colored bishops, and he castles but Hikaru emerges from the opening with a 34-minute time advantage. Technically, it's like 33 in five seconds, but that's a big deal. That is a very, very, very big deal. This is a completely different story from Madrid 2022. Some of you weren't even born in 2022. That year, they played in the first round of the candidates. Hikaru lost. This time, he clearly has the upper hand, and he sacrifices a pawn. He gives up a pawn, because it really can't be taken because of all this pressure, to get the bishop and to simplify the game into an opposite colored bishop position. Fabi does this, rookie one, Hikaru gives up this, takes back on b2, and plays bishop six. Hikaru's still up 35 minutes on the clock, he's playing quickly, he's playing confidently, he's got the opposite colored bishops, and he knows that in the long run, this is probably going to be good enough to hold. And a draw against Fabiano with the black pieces in the first round of the candidates is a very good way to go. All right, eight, eight and a half is the magic number to win the candidates. Queen d5, but Fabi, not to be outdone, gets in with the queen. Hikaru now spends 35 minutes on a move. 35 minutes. 
Probably about five of those minutes were spent thinking about the move, and 30 were spent thinking about daffodils, or I don't know, whatever chess players think about when they're playing chess. It, it's prob probably not chess. So, the thing is, Black's position is on the verge of complete collapse. Like, optically, Black's position looks beyond garbage. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to insult what Hikaru is doing. Hikaru took a very deliberate thing in this game. He, he, he went for the position that looked optically bad, and he's trying to solve his problems, all right? But guess what? The problems have not been solved. Hikaru finds a rook sacrifice here, by the way. A defensive one. You can't take this. Because after queen h4, you're under a massive attack. You go king f1, I have rook e8, and despite being up a full rook, that's checkmate. So, like, you gotta be really careful, right? g3 stops the mate, queen h3 falls right back into mate. Hikaru plays rook f2, which is a ridiculous move. I mean, getting hit with rook f2 is, is brutal. But Fabi's still better, and not only is Fabi better, at this point, the engine gave Fabiano a winning advantage. Deep engine analysis here shows that it's not 0.6, as this engine is saying, but it's like 1.3. But Fabi has 12 minutes to make 13 moves, because that is the time control of the candidates. And the candidates, they play five, six-hour games. On the 40th move of the game, they get an extra time to play the rest of the game, and there's no bonus time. There's no bonus time. For the first 40 moves. So Fabi could lose on time if he starts thinking here. A lot, right? And you'll notice Hikaru played this move very quickly. And Fabi said that actually kind of got him a little spooked because he thought he was better. He's up a pawn. He could start pushing. But if he starts pushing this pawn, Hikaru, he's going to get his rooks. Right? White's king a little bit. So he goes here. And all the advantage is gone. He does this. They start trading. And despite being a pawn up, Fabi can't move these two pawns. He tries. I mean, he definitely starts moving them. But Hikaru is so active here. Look at this move, rook a8, by the way. What? He, j he just hung the rook. No, because then queen takes e then queen e2 check, and you win the rook back. And Hikaru, this game, defended stubbornly, won the pawn back, and this is just going to be a draw. Fabi makes it to the time control. And uh, in this position, the players agree to a draw. You'll notice that they gained some time on the 40th move. They gained 30 minutes. This one ends in a draw. A very big improvement from the candidates of 2022 by Hikaru. A combative draw with Black. I have no idea why he decided to make it exquisitely exciting for the fans. But a very good start. Both of these guys now have half a point. Now, uh, Nijad Abasov, the underdog. 26-32 from Azerbaijan. And not only that, uh, I did an interview with him. He's a torn ACL. You're going to see photos of the tournament. He's literally wearing a brace. He had surgery like a few months ago versus Yanni Pomnishi. Yanni Pomnishi is a two-time winner of the candidates back-to-back. -back. He's played in two candidates and he's won two candidates. And I have a statistics degree, which makes me think that he's going to play in his third candidates and he might win it because that's how probabilities work. But this game starts out with a Queen's Gambit declined. It's an exchange variation. Uh, excuse me. It is not an exchange variation is what I meant to say. Exchange variation would be if white takes. Very solid. But here's the thing. If white wants to play a queen's gambit and do nothing, like if white plays a queen's gambit declined, right? Plays into it like this and just wants to do absolutely nothing in this game, black has to take massive risk and it's not possible to win. Um, and uh, what ends up happening in this game is Nijat plays bishop takes knight and d5. And you will notice Jan with the black pieces is up 20 minutes because he played a very solid line. Like, it's round one of the candidates. Some, some players like Hikaru get really exotic with it and some guys literally trade every single piece and go home in an hour. And this was the position after 24 moves. Who's to blame? I don't know. Unstoppable force meets a movable object. I mean, Jan just wanted to get the candidates underway, and I think kind of so did Nijat. You know, a little bit of an underdog story. You, you don't want to, like, burn all the bridges in the first game, and it's a Queen's Gambit decline. Like, what are you going to do, right? And you'll notice Nijat was kind of thinking early. Like, he spent five minutes, then he spent uh, another, like, he spent 18 minutes on this move, right? Like, Jan was just sort of doing his thing, and yeah, I mean, it's sort of up to White. Like, if White wants to do this... Uh, the players agree to a draw after 34 moves, right? They shuffle around, they make a draw. Okay, so Nijat and Nepo have the same score as Fabiano and uh, Hikaru. Now, we're going to pop on over to the women's candidates. Alexandra Goryachkina versus Katerina uh, Lagno. This is a, uh, a another Sicilian defense. This one, Bishop B5. This is known as the Rossellimo. And here, Lagno plays a, a huge sideline. Like, the whole reason you go here is because you want to not allow this to be a check 
Which is why it's super weird that in this position you then play d6 anyway, but, it, but it's very uncompromising. I mean, it's basically, uh, it's just the choice, and now you play bishop d7, so that if bishop takes knight, you take back with the bishop instead of the pawn. And now you waited too long, so white goes bishop f1. I'm, I'm telling you, you're gonna watch this as a beginner, you're gonna be very confused, but the entire point is, I brought this out here to make you commit to setting up like that, now I slide the rook, put the bishop there, and now I'm going to put two pawns in the center, but black is going to stop that. But in stopping that, black is going to allow me access to these squares, which is why I do all of this. Like, chess is very complicated and very tough to understand at a high level, and I just told you white wants to play d4, right? White wants to get a big center. Well, white plays d3. So, Goryachkina down 20 minutes on the clock in the opening, but she is securing the control of the light squares in the center, and... Uh, if black is successful at any point in lashing out in the position, black is going to have a great time. Which is why Garyachkina is trying to trade off Lagno's knight from controlling the center. She is able to do that. What a move, by the way. I mean, knight f5 is an incredible idea. And it's kind of a Trojan horse, because if you take, I'm going to get a big attack. Which is why she didn't take. So the knight went back. <laughs> the knight was on e3, but it rotated this way, right? Now g5, now Goryachkina going for it. h5, locking the whole thing down, but yeah, Goryachkina, oh my goodness, that is a crazy maneuvering sequence. Queen e6, queen d1, and still white is looking to kind of poke and prod, but black breaks out. Uh, both players at around 15 minutes, and suddenly, it and, and sometimes it just so happens that just, it's just nothing you can do. Rook f8, rook e2, and uh, the players here literally just shuffle the pieces, and that is the way they make the draw. Three-time repetition in chess, when you shuffle three times or the position repeats three times. Could the game have kept going from here, like knight, knight here? Yeah. Lagno could have played queen g5 or queen h4. If this is round seven of the candidates, like if this is round eight, if this is later in the event and the players kind of know their form, uh, black will probably keep the game going. That's just the truth. But it's round one. I think a lot of the players are trying to find their footing. You know, you wake up every day at the candidates and don't want to get zero points. It's just sort of the reality. So I'm kind of getting the quick draws out of the way. Gukesh versus Vidit. This is a big one. All India matchup in the first game. Uh, this one, a Tarash. This is known as the Tarash defense. A very aggressive choice. And you notice that uh, Gukesh does not take... The Tarash is a very forcing line. White has the option to clear the entire center. Black would go here attacking the, uh, the, the knight. Here, then black has like some crazy lines like b5. I mean, you know, if, if white goes here, black can take and then play like queen a5 check. It's not the best way, but I'm just saying that's sort of like the little idea uh, in a nutshell. But Gukesh plays a very solid and sober approach and the position is completely symmetrical after five moves. Completely symmetrical. And this is not good. You can't get an advantage here with white. Because black is just going to copy you the whole time. So, Gukesh does this. And then he does rook a2, rook d2. What the... What? Yeah. Rook a2, rook d2. This game explodes. Gukesh says, you know what? I'm going to put the cannon on the d file. I'm going to open up the g file. And Vidit says, oh yeah? Go ahead. Take my center pawn. Not only does Vidit castle onto the g-file, he also gives up a pawn completely in the center. Now, it's not exactly a free pawn because this is not Vidit's idea, right? This is losing for black. That's not Vidit's idea. The idea is that after cd5, uh, black can play bishop e5, target the knight, and then get this. Also, black can apparently go here, which is completely deranged. Losing a pawn for nothing, but black is better. And uh, yeah, I mean, somehow white's position is bad. Bishop b2 from Gukesh. And that's what Vidit does. So Vidit finds this idea. And Vidit understands that despite being down a pawn, he has a lot of activities. A file is going to activate. The bishop is pressuring this. And somehow white just doesn't have a lot of harmony. Just doesn't have a lot of harmony. What is he going to do? Right? White can play, like, like how does white defend this? If white comes over here, right, we're going to get this. Bishop d set. Like, what is white's plan? Like, if white does this, black will just focus on that side of the board. Like, there's no attack. Which is why... Just like in a couple of these other games that you are seeing, there is a bailout process. I mean, this looks really, really, really dangerous. Queen c2, and Vidit is better here. I mean, he has, he, the world is kind of his oyster in this position. Uh, I know the engine says this, but practically speaking, you can't possibly tell me that this does not look very nice for black. But Vidit spends a while here and goes here. So, Vidit spent 40 minutes on this move. Gukesh fell asleep at the board? No, I'm just kidding. 
Bishop G4 is a is a nice idea, uh, and it's very aggressive, but and just so you understand, the idea is pawn takes rook c8, attacking the queen. And now when the queen steps somewhere, the rook comes in and white can't defend himself. White has three pieces on their home squares, on the home square, right? So it doesn't work. So bishop g4 is actually a brilliant idea. Only one problem, this. And now that's hanging and that is still hanging. Queen a3. White can take if white wants to go on a roller coaster ride. But Gukesh says it's the first round of the candidates. So we've reached a position where I can take massive risk, but I won't. So we're seeing a lot of games sort of peter out. Right? Seeing a lot of games, like, be tense, but players are getting on the scoreboard. Uh, this is Anna Muzichuk from Ukraine versus uh, Nurgul Salimova from Bulgaria. Actually, funny story about this match. Uh, Nurgul beat Anna to qualify for this tournament. So they played in the Women's World Cup. And uh, this one is a Petrov. Okay, next game. No, uh, jokes aside, this one was a, was a weird sideline of the Petrov where White gives up the pawn in the center and develops. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they traded, and it's a middle game where white has some activity, but white did not get a whole lot in this game. Uh, white tried and pushed, and right around here kind of had an active position. Like, I think Nurgul was a bit on the back foot. It was a little bit unpleasant, and white definitely was more active, but Nurgul was defending, and I'm really not sure Anna could have done much better. This is a very, very well-timed idea by Black making white either open up the position or do what she did in the game, which is allow the pawn all the way down. But yeah, rook d8, strong counterplay, trades the pieces, and uh, good defense from Nurgul. Honestly, just a very good first round game for the candidates. It's her first candidates. I think she's uh, 19. So she's the youngest participant on the women's side. The second youngest being Vaishali, who is 21 or 22. I think she's 22. And uh, yeah, 19 years of age. First game is a draw against, uh, I mean, a perennial top five woman of the last, like, 10 years. And a Muzichuk, so really not, not much uh, better you could ask for. But a lot of draws, as you can see. Like, round one was relatively peaceful, but the last couple of games are anything but peaceful. This is Vaishali Ramesh Babu, sister of Prague, brother and sister playing in the candidates, versus uh, Humpy Konru, who is a legend of the game. I mean, she has been also perennial, like top player and it's very cool that these different generations are clashing from the same country like for Vaishali I mean I'm not putting words in her mouth that's not my intention but I can imagine maybe Humpy was like even a, a role model or somebody she looked at as the icon of the nation right uh and this one is an Italian where white gets a lot of queenside space Italian is one of the most topical openings nowadays uh h6 is one of the ways to um to play and so is g6 you play like h6, g6. White can play in a handful of ways. Castling is one of the ways. Uh, but uh, you could also play h6 like uh, way back here. Like knight f6, d3, h6. This is also another way of playing. But okay, h6. And then black's bishop is forced back there. If you want me to explain that to you, I literally can't. But this is the entire purpose. Black is trying to accomplish this move, d5. Uh, and that is actually... Uh, this is almost the reason why you you you, you know you might castle and, and play rookie one first, but now that black is able to play d5, you're going to kind of get a uh, more open game, a6, a3, and at some point the center will explode, and there it goes. And then the center explodes, the pieces are traded, Humpy tries to approach on the, on the uh, queen side. A very nice idea here by Vaishali, looking to secure some squares, but a well-timed queen e6. And uh, this might look really bad, these pawns, and I gotta tell you, they are a little ugly, but they do the job, and they completely stop any of White's ideas, so she goes here instead, but uh, pressure was on for a little while, but Humpy defended very well, kicked out the rook, and then rotated the knight, rotated the queen, it was a lot of rotations in this game, and as you might imagine, pieces were traded, nobody's gonna win this position, and a peaceful resolution in the game by Shali versus uh, Humpy as well. But, not in the last two games of this recap. This is Lei Tsingjie versus Tan Zhongyi, and we will end with Ali Reza Firuja versus Pragnananda, Ramesh Babu. Lei Tsingjie is the uh, defending winner of this tournament, uh, and um, she, uh, she was the challenger. She was playing against Ju Wenjun, and Tan Zhongyi, also this Chinese wave of uh, players, uh, they have to, everybody from uh, the same country plays in the first round, at least they try to. This one also starts out with uh, d5 on the third move. We saw that in the, uh, in this game, 
in the game between Abasov and Nepo. Same exact uh, concept, same move order. But this time we have an exchange. So we have an exchange, which is something that we did not have in this game, right? That's why I said it was not an exchange variation. And that allowed Jan to kind of simplify. So, Lei Tsingjia plays uh, the exchange variation, and now we'll play, uh, you know, queen c2, bishop d3, knight d2, there's this play. But Tan Yi goes here. And that is one of the rarest moves in the position, which you might look at and go, how is that, uh, how is that so rare? It attacks the queen, it looks very natural. It looks weird because it allows queen b3 attacking the pawn. Now, this is the reason Lei Tsingjia, you know, she just plays queen c2, she kind of keeps it moving, but... That is a weird place for the bishop, especially because it could be a target, right? So, h3, and now the bishop goes back to e6, and white just sort of plays. I mean, white just says, all right, like, whatever, you wanted the bishop there. And now Tan Zhongyi plays this, trading the bishop. So she's looking for kind of an immediate simplification in some capacity, right? We have knight takes e4. If this was played, and then this, you can't take. It looks like you can... A queen before, but actually, as it turns out, you can play like this. The uh, the engine actually doesn't really mind it. Black will be able to get back into the game, but you kind of don't want to enter the dra you know the lions then. So Lei Tsingjie just trades some pieces, plays very solidly, and here I thought has an excellent position. Right, she's a great position. Uh, and I have something in my eyeball. So B4, All right? Rookie eight castles. Queen g5. This is a threat. So white goes here. And white plays b5. And Lei Tsingjie is just bulldozing the queen side. Th this is what's called a queen side uh, minority versus a queen side majority. It's three pawns versus four. And you're just trying to kind of go down that side of the board and break. Trying to get a4, a5, a6. Crack these pawns. Get in. Win the game. Rookie six. Okay, so black is trying to create counterplay while also playing defense. Uh, now, in this position... BC is a little bit fast. Instead, apparently, this is a little bit better to kind of protect and then maybe regroup. But it's a, it's a very it's a very tense position. Bishop f3, and still the position looks completely fine for white. White is totally not in any danger. Queen a5, queen c7, queen h4. But there's nothing. I mean, there's absolutely nothing. Um, but here, Lei uh, gets a little bit spooked. She obviously didn't like something here. Uh, she didn't like this. She did not like the prospect of that move. And what's kind of funny is that rook c1 here is the best move. And after bishop h3, you just go queen h2. So it doesn't quite work. Rook c1 threatens rook c6. So if black plays a6, you take. If bishop h3, you take and you're not getting made it. And then at the end of the whole thing, you play queen h2, right? So rook c1 going for this pawn, continuing with all of this, would have been the right way. But instead of that, she kind of panics. She goes here. In 10 minutes, she trades the queens thinking, well, this is solid, I can't lose. But suddenly it starts to spin out of control. Black plays very solidly, very smart defensive chess. And Lei just loses a pawn. She takes this one, but she loses that one. She must have thought she was going to win one back here. But Black just is up a pawn. And, you know, the engine is always thinking positions like this are drawish. But as the game goes on and time gets low, we see if move 40, time is added. Black is winning. I mean, black is up a pawn. And black is going to stop that one. And and and, and uh, Tan Zhong Yi just very slowly, methodically, look at this move G5, by the way, setting a checkmate net. King's made it. So white has to sacrifice, and now it's all over. The king is hunted out. Rook a1, this is check, the pawn is stopped, king f3, and in this position, after h4, rook g8, uh, Lei resigns, because she can protect her pawn, g4, h5, take, 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 and you will just lose this endgame. Crazy. Dan Zhong Yi wins. She beats the defending champion, which leaves us with the, probably the most exciting game of the round, Ali Reza Firuja versus Pragdananda, the battle of the young, uh, the young men. And uh, Ali Reza, 20, I think, or 21. Uh, 20, I think he's 20. He might be 21. He's born in 2003. So there's a higher chance that he's 20 than 21, unless he's born in the earlier part of the year. But I think he's born in June, but I might be wrong. Anyway, and Prague is like 12. Uh, no, Prague is uh, 17, uh, he's 18. Spanish, 
Bishop a4, and now, not just any Spanish, the open Spanish, the Spanish where you take and everything goes crazy. d4, b5, d5, takes, bishop e6, cutting edge theory on the board, bishop c2, queen e1, oh my goodness, unpinning, allowing your king to be opened up and oiled up, knight bd2, knight e6, the king slides out of the way. The, and you know why the king slides out of the way? Because the king knows that when this opens up, the rook is going to the g-file. That's exactly what happens. Now you notice, neither guy is thinking much. Bishop g5. Both guys playing on the ideas that they are familiar with. The bishop goes there. You know why it goes there? Because you're trying to get rid of white's bishop. Which is a super weird idea. But do you know what the idea... Do you know what the actual idea of bishop g5 is? Do you know why the bishop went out there to trade? Because black's bishop was superfluous. There was nowhere to put it. The black queen wanted to activate... But you're not going to put your bishop on c5. So instead, you trade the bishop, and then you play queen h4. And both guys are implementing the game plan. It's a very imbalanced game. What is going on? Rook g4, the queen is just hanging around. Eyes on here, eyes on here, eyes on the king. Knight d3, queen e2. And I mean, it looks like Ali Reza is about to just go straight down the board. And he's got a 20-minute time advantage. But Prague, well-timed. f5, a counter-strike. Getting an on passant in, but now he brings in his rook. Ali Reza plays f4. The pawn is on the way. Rook g7, an idea. It doesn't work. You don't win the, the queen, because this is there. But it's an idea. Rook h6. That's checkmate. You got to do something about it. How about this move? Queen playing defense. Here comes Prague with his other rook. Now, here's the thing. If this ever goes to an endgame, like, let's just say something like this. Black is always better. Black is better because these pawns are terrible. They're not good. So white really needs to keep pieces on the board the right way. Rook e1, a very, very tense game. Rook h5. Now, Ali Reza decides a4. Ali Reza has half, less than half the time of his opponent, and he has 12 minutes to make 13 moves. You know who else had 12 minutes to make 13 moves? Remember this guy over here? Fabiano Luigi Caruana? Yes, his middle name is Luigi. I'm not just, quote, I'm not just talking about Mario and Luigi. He looks like his middle name is Luigi, all right? Yeah, tw he also had 12 minutes for, thir for 13 moves. And what did Fabi do? He started trading because he was like, you know what? I got to relieve the tension a little bit, simplify. Ali Reza says, I'm opening up a new front of attack. Rook h6. There's, there's like really brutal stuff that's going to happen over here. Rook e2. Five minutes. He has five minutes to make 12 moves. There's no bonus time. He has five minutes to make 12 moves. Do you understand? 12 moves is a lot of moves. And you might play Bullet or Blitz. That's a lot of moves. It's the candidates. A lot is on the line. Rook h3. The queen goes back. This is a free pawn. But believe it or not, it might be better to go here to keep the tension. To force white to play defense. And maybe even play a move like b4. Giving up a pawn to secure the d4 square. I mean... Is a very big moment in this game. It's the first game of the candidates. Do you go all in? Do you do do you not go all in? He takes the free pawn. But by taking the free pawn, Ali Reza jumps to c5. Oh my god. You can't take. And the knight is hanging. You can't take because rook e8 and you lose your queen. Rook e8 is game over. It's lights out. So is Ali Reza winning? A well-timed strike. Queen h5. The knight is completely abandoned, but mate is still there if the rook moves, and the rook is hanging. And now the best move is rook eg2, bringing in the queen with pressure on the g. That would have been the best move. And Prague would have had to find the unfathomable, the only move, knight e5, giving up the knight completely. But the point is, the queen is now blocked, and then he would have had to find queen f7, giving up a knight completely with rook. What is this? How is that? What? What about bishop d? Yeah, but the knight is hanging. That's the real problem. So... If in this position, Ali Reza had played rook g2, Prague would have had to find the only move knight e5. I don't know if he saw it or what, but instead of that, with low time, he goes here, knight g5, and the dust settles with a rook sacrifice and a perpetual check. In the final position, Prague is down a knight and a bishop. A knight and a bishop, but white cannot escape. He cannot escape the vortex of checks. Nobody can defend, and the game ends in a draw. Oh my goodness, so 7 out of 8 games in the first round ended in draws. This one was ridiculous. Most of the games were pretty kind of boring-ish, you know, just kind of easing into it. The Fabi Hikaru game was back and forth. Hikaru played uh, very practically well in that game, posing some problems for, for Fabiano to convert. Fabi was never in danger in that game, but to convert any type of advantage that he had. 
And Tan Zhong Yi, the only winner of the day, leads uh, the women's candidates with one point. But you, you, don't, you don't need to know all of that. You, we got 13 more rounds to go. Uh, all courses are 33% off during the candidate sale. And um, do check out the interviews. I will be rolling out all the interviews with Yanni Pomnishi. Uh, I recorded a second one with Hikaru. Vishy Anand. I'm super stoked, super excited. And uh, you know the drill. Get out of here.